Unlike surface-emitting diode lasers, edge-emitting diode lasers don't produce a circular beam profile. The slightly higher refractive index of the junction acts as a waveguide, propagating in a transverse electric mode, conducting light along the junction to the edge of the semiconductor die, where the light is then emitted. So the beam has this pancake shape, polarized in the long direction, or rather the major axis. But because the width and length of the edge of the junction are different, this polarization quickly reverses with more diffraction of the light in the vertical direction. The result is an elliptically shaped beam, linearly polarized along the minor axis. The wavefront is astigmatic, that is, it appears to have originated from a different focal point for the major and minor widths of the ellipse. A collimation lens puts a stop to the divergence, although not perfectly because with astigmatism the sagittal and tangential rays have different focal points. And furthermore, collimation does nothing for the often undesirable oblong shape of the beam. The elliptical output of an edge-emitting diode laser is corrected a few different ways, including passing the beam through an anamorphic prism. Not any prism, but one that results in an unequal magnification of the major and minor axes. Only with this unequal magnification do we see an ellipse turn into a circle. Not all prisms are anamorphic, and prisms aren't the only way to produce the anamorphic effect. Cylindrical lenses and mirrors also produce different magnification in orthogonal directions. The first patent I'll dive into describes a single anamorphic prism. Because it's optically equivalent but less trouble to set up, I'm going to leave out the facets and just use triangular shaped prisms. It is, after all, these angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, that define the prism. The facets serve no optical function other than possibly clipping the beam if it gets too close to one of them. A beam strikes the first surface of the prism at an angle of incidence I sub 1. But this angle is only seen from one direction, above. A viewer located on the side will only be able to measure the 90 degree angle that the beam makes with the surface. So whenever a line intersects a plane, there are always two angles between the plane and the line. An azimuthal angle, which in this case is I sub 1, and an altitudinal angle, in this case 90 degrees. The change in beam width, or the magnification, depends on these angles, and depends separately in each direction. The net result is that an elliptical incident beam emerges from the other side of the prism with its horizontal width changed. If the angles in the prism are just the right values, then the horizontal axis can be changed just enough for the emerging beam to be circular. The prism is situated horizontally with its two triangular faces parallel to the XZ plane, which cuts through the midplane of the prism. An elliptical beam is incident with its minor axis in the X direction, so the narrow dimension of the beam experiences the skew incident angle, while the wide dimension of the beam experiences a 90 degree incident angle. The beam illuminates the glass the same way that a shadow is cast. On the front entry face of the prism, the narrow portion of the beam now seems wide. The refracted beam proceeds to the back face where total internal reflection sends it to the exit face. Refraction at the exit face produces a horizontal width that happens, by design, to equal the vertical width. The final result is a linearly polarized circular beam, with the polarization direction parallel to the plane of incidence, both before and after passing through the prism. Besides being round, it's often needed for the outgoing to be in the same direction as the incoming and along the same line as the incoming beam, in which case the outgoing beam would be collinear with the incoming beam. The three angles of the prism control the direction of the outgoing beam. They render it parallel to the incoming beam. Where the beam strikes the front entry face determines whether or not the input and output beams are collinear. Suppose a beam is incident at this height. It will propagate through the prism and emerge too high. Suppose it's incident at this height. It will propagate through the prism and emerge too low. Suppose the beam is incident at the mama bear height. It will propagate through the prism and emerge just right. With the three internal angles of the prism set, turning a beam of a certain eccentricity into a circle is a function of the input angle I sub 1 which controls the magnification of the minor width of the ellipse. Remember that the major width is not altered. Its magnification is 1. 
It's beneficial, if possible, to choose alpha, beta, and gamma such that I sub 1 delivers the desired magnification when it is close as possible to the Brewster angle, because when parallel polarized light is incident at the Brewster angle, there's no Fresnel reflection. The design concept works with a wide range of alpha, beta, and gamma. What's needed is a useful expression for the anamorphic magnification in terms of the prism angles and the incident angle I sub 1. These are things that can be controlled. It will also be useful to know how the incoming and outgoing incident angles are related to the prism. A picture shows why the sum of these two external angles is equal to the prism angle gamma. The horizontal line represents both the incoming and the outgoing beams. This angle shown to the left is 90 degrees plus the angle of incidence, making this interior angle 90 degrees minus the angle of incidence. Likewise, this angle on the right is 90 degrees plus the outgoing angle of refraction, making this interior angle 90 degrees minus that angle of refraction. Because the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees, the final result is that the outgoing angle of refraction plus the incoming angle of incidence adds to the lower vertex angle, gamma. This will be useful for finding the magnification, which describes how refraction influences the width of the refracted beam in comparison to the width of the incident beam. These two lines, which are perpendicular to their respective beams, form triangles with inner angles I sub 1 and R sub 1. Call the edge that is shared by these two triangles H, because it's also the hypotenuse of both triangles. Intuitively, magnification is the ratio of outgoing beam width to incoming beam width, where the widths are readily put in terms of the angles. Cancel the H and you're left with an expression for beam magnification in terms of the incidence and refraction angles at an interface. Apply this expression to the entry point and again to the exit point of the prism. The total magnification of the minor axis is the product of those two magnifications. Reflection off of flat surfaces has unity magnification, so there's no contribution from the back surface. Use Snell's law to rewrite the internal angles in terms of the external angles. Eliminate R sub 2 in favor of the more controllable I sub 1 using the expression up top that we just came up with, and the magnification is finally expressed as this foreboding yet simple expression that only contains the angle of incidence and the vertex angle gamma. The embodiment example in the patent uses these prism angles with an incident angle of 70.7 .7 degrees. The refractive index corresponds to BK7 glass. Run these numbers through the expression and the result is a magnification of the minor axis of 2. Remember there's no magnification of the vertical axis. So if the minor width is half the major width, then an ellipse is turned into a circle by this prism. In order to set up a ray trace, the coordinates of the corners of the prism need to be written down. These facets are needlessly complicated to set up, so I'm going to leave them out and just use the complete triangle. The patent example includes the angles and the glass type. Absent from the description is the actual size of the prism. That's because it's the angles that determine its usefulness as an anamorphic component. It needs to be big enough to capture the entire beam and pass it along. The actual size is up to the designer. I'll use a 6 by 6 millimeter square for the entry face. The angles would dictate the rest. I wrote the prism prescription on this page in my notes. There are six vertices or corners and the XYZ coordinates need to be written down for each. I'll arbitrarily put the XYZ origin at the center of the entry face. The X, Y, and Z axes shown here form a right-handed coordinate system. The entry face vertices, numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4, are located with these coordinates. To compute the back vertices 5 and 6, use vertices 1, 2, 3, and 4 in the angles alpha and gamma, and a little trigonometry. Now there are five faces, three side face rectangles, and two top and bottom triangles. This sketch is a top view of the prism. The faces are defined by its vertices. The entry face is bounded by vertices 1, 2, 4, and 3. The order is not accidental. Solid modelers require the vertices to be listed in order, no jaywalking across the shape. The reflection surface in the back is bounded by vertices 1, 2, 6, and 5, and the exit surface is bounded by vertices 3, 4, 6, and 5. The letter R means rectangle and is required in the setup file, as is the zero that trails it 
which is a flag to indicate whether or not the surface is reflective. Zero means not reflective. We're relying on total internal reflection for the reflective surface to do its job, and ray tracing software is smart enough to figure that out. The letter T is used to indicate a triangle with the top surface bounded by 1, 3, and 5, and the bottom surface by 2, 4, and 6. Now I'm ready to set up the sequential ray trace. But because there are more than two surfaces in a prism, the rays inside the prism need to be traced non-sequentially, or sequentially with a few coordinate breaks. Let's see how that works. We need five objects in the Lens Data Editor. I'll make the third object the stop. That's where the prism will be. So the entrance pupil diameter, I'll make it 0 0.5. So imagine a half millimeter diameter beam coming in. I'm going to go ahead and set a broad spectrum of wavelengths. The object's at infinity, but I want to be able to see light coming in, so I'm going to have an object of thickness 1 before the prism. And then there's the prism, and that's where we go into mixed mode ray tracing. Type in non-sequential component. Everything has an infinite radius, but there are no curved surfaces. And go into the non-sequential editor in order to put something there. It will be a polygon object. OK. Right here is the polygon object editor. And we're going to have to start typing. First, a few comments. Begin with the front face vertices. This prism has three rectangles and two triangles, and they're defined by including the flag R and then calling out the vertices. R for rectangle, T for triangle. Vertex 1, 2, 4, and 3 makes that rectangle. A rectangle is something that has four vertices, so it may not be a rectangle. And then there are two flags. The first one answers whether or not it's reflective, and I'll just say zero for no. And the second one is a face type, and I haven't defined any face types in this file, so I'm just going to leave that zero. And the next face, and the next, and then the triangles. T is for triangle, only three vertices. Still have to answer if reflective and face type. And that's the POB file that defines this polygon. It has to be saved, so I'll go up here to File Save. Take that as. Let's call it the patent number. Go ahead and make the material BK7. And you'll notice these errors come up. You'll see why when I go into the layout view. I'll go ahead and enter in a tilt about Y of 70.7. .7. That's right out of the patent. These X, Y, and Z positions need to be tinkered with. And I'll show you how. Go to Analyze 3D Viewer. Let's look at it from the X, Z direction. The entrance port of this non-sequential object is too far to the left. Begin by just moving it in the Z direction. Let's try 10 millimeters. And notice there's no error now. There's a polygon that we drew, the prism. You can see it's a three-dimensional prism. We have light coming in. I need to get the beam to continue on its way. Let's just begin by having some bigger clear semi-diameters. At least twice as big as the beam. Make the Z position 3. It's a little more sane, so now it's up close. And there's still no beams coming out. The reason why is because the export location non-sequential object isn't on the other side of the non-sequential object. Let's go to Lens Data Editor, and you see these exit locations. Exit location for X, Y, and Z. So for Z, oh, let's make it 10. And now we see some lines. The light stops here because there's no image surface for it to go to. You notice how the light is coming out much higher than it's going in. That needs to be adjusted. Let me float this, and now let's go into the non-sequential editor, and I'm going to change the height of the prism inside of the non-sequential object. Do that by changing the X position. Oh, I think I need to move it in the negative direction. Oh yeah, see now some rays are hitting the image. And now a little more rays are hitting the image surface. And now more, maybe... I don't want to do too much more about getting the light to hit this image until I take care of the incoming beam shape. So the light that goes in should be elliptical in shape. And let's take a look at it right now. I'm looking at the XY plane and just looking at surface 1. Instead of XY fan, let's look at a ring. A circular beam of light is coming in. And it's supposed to be elliptical. The easiest way to get an elliptical beam is to do it with vignetting. So go to the Field Data Editor. Set VCX to 0 0.5 to get an ellipse where it's half as wide as it is tall. And now it looks right. All of the beams are being captured. The anamorphic effect requires that one of the external angles be large, which forces a tight tolerance on the angular positioning of the prism. Let's take a look at the uh, object surface. 
and we have a ellipse that's half as wide, a minor radius of 0.125 and a major radius of 0.25. Looking at the output, just change the surfaces to surface 4, the uh, image surface, and we have a circular beam coming out with a radius of 0.25. Let's look at the chromatic behavior. Turn on all wavelengths, maybe fewer rays. Color the rays by the wavelength and zoom in. Look at how separated they are. The amount of separation is actually not the measure of achromaticity. It's the divergence angle of each color that measures the achromaticity. And to see that, go into the merit function editor. So ring. They all have different ring values. You can see how different they are. So these are the divergences. If this were achromatic, these diff values would be zero. But of course, it's a prism. Splitting light is what prisms do. Every color is going to come out at a different angle. We need to look at a way to achromatize this. And achromatization requires two different glass types. This pattern describes a pair of anamorphic prisms to make the beam circular with minimum dispersion. The problem with dispersion is that different wavelengths emerge at different angles so the spectrum will diverge. This may seem unimportant with nearly monochromatic lasers. Both tunable diode lasers maintaining beam direction over the tuning range is a required specification. This isn't the first reference in the patent literature to using anamorphic prism pairs for beam shaping. The earliest one I could find was a 1980 patent. But this one has the added feature of low dispersion. The design example in the patent produces a magnification of one-third, which is obviously less than one. So this time the major axis is in the plane of incidence and will shrink down in size. Because the prisms are made from different materials, I'll need to set up a separate non-sequential object for each of them. Using the numbers provided in the patent example, I pinpointed the locations of the vertices. The rectangular and triangular surfaces are defined by these vertex arrangements. You'll notice that the coordinates for the two prisms have different origins. Note also that the separation between the prisms given by this length D2 actually has no effect on the performance. Finally, in the patent example, the back prism is made from SF11 flint glass and the front prism is made from KF9 crown glass. I could improve the performance by using a different crown glass and I'll show you why. With the object at infinity, a dummy surface 1 is used to begin the visible ray trace 4 millimeters before the first prism, surface 2. I set the entrance port diameter for the first prism to 5 millimeters. The exit port is located 4 millimeters behind the entrance port. The second prism then follows a 3 millimeter thick dummy surface. The exit port of the second prism is set to be 6 millimeters behind the entry port. I added a 3 millimeter thick dummy surface just so we can view the outgoing rays before they strike the image surface. This time, the image surface is very large because in this invention, the outgoing beam is at a different height above the incoming beam. The non-sequential object for surface 2 is stored in the file anamorphic prism front.pob and I made the glass NK5 a selection that I'll need to explain. The non-sequential object for surface 4 is stored in a different file. It has an X offset of 5 millimeters. The X, Y, and Z coordinates of the second prism are not important as long as the beam passes through it. The tilt about Y has been made a variable. The second prism's tilt will be the only variable used for optimization. And here's the front prism, with the vertices and faces so defined. The rotation axis of the second prism, used for optimization, appears in this picture in red. In this invention, the prisms are not oriented to minimize Fresnel reflection. So a small one degree tilt on the first prism is needed to prevent reflected light from feeding directly back into the laser. Having entered the X, Y, and Z coordinates for the six vertices, the three rectangles and two triangles can be added, with the second prism then written as a separate non-sequential object. The origin is placed at this upper corner. Its location inside the solid model file isn't important. The non-sequential object itself is placed sequentially in the model and is given XYZ coordinates in the non-sequential data editor. Although the circularity and alignment of the outgoing beam turned out to be great, there was room to improve its achromatic performance, done by choosing a glass with a different Abe number. The back flint glass is in a narrow region of the glass map, leaving no options for different Abe numbers, but the front crown glass is in a very wide section of the glass map. 
Increasing that Abe number significantly improved the achromaticity, so I went with NK5, which has the same refractive index as the original glass, but higher Abe number. The output is nearly parallel to the input. Some chromatic separation is visible, although it's undetectable by eye in this picture. Each color has a slightly different divergence angle. The outgoing beam is round in this 3D view, rotated around, and you can see the glass prisms in three dimensions, and on the other side we see the elliptical beam coming in. Let me show you what effect exposition and tilt about Y has changed exposition from 5 as I have it set to, oh, say 0. Watch what happens to the prism. 0, that's 1, 3, 5, 7, back to 5. The location doesn't matter so much. If I change it from 5 to 4.4, there's no change in the outgoing beam. Tilt about Y will be an optimization variable. Right now it's set to 0 degrees. Suppose it were set to 5 degrees. That's what it does to the prism, or minus 10 degrees. Try minus 30 because the prism was originally rotated 30 degrees. And there you go. Now it's back to the front face being vertical. And now we'll run optimization. In order to simultaneously improve the alignment of the emerging beam and further improve the achromaticity, I constructed a merit function to calculate the ray angle at the image surface across a wide range of the visible spectrum, much wider than the tuning range of a laser. The value of each ring operator ray angle should be zero, as should the differences between them. These diff operands are the measure of achromaticity. The optimizer will attempt to bring each of them to within plus or minus one milliradian. The only variable is the tilt of the second prism about the y-axis. Run local optimization, and the improvement can be noted in reduction of the two larger ray angles. And even more important, these three wavelengths emerge more in the same direction. Still not great, but the tuning range of a laser doesn't require dispersionless transmission over the entire visible spectrum. If I make the back prism out of the same material as the front prism, now the ray angle differences are quite large, 10 milliradians. You making the two prisms out of two different materials definitely helps. The anamorphic performance was good even before optimization, with a magnification of the major width of one-third. Although parallel, the outgoing beam is not along the same line as the incoming beam, which is why I chose to use a large image surface in order to capture it wherever it emerged. That was just easier to do than decentering the image surface. A good question is, why use two anamorphic prisms when the previous patent clearly showed that one is enough? One reason is that with two prisms, smaller incident angles are possible, which helps to loosen the tolerances. But the real reason is that two prisms provide versatility. With one prism, only one magnification is possible because only one incident angle produces a parallel outgoing ray. With two prisms, there are two angles that can be adjusted, and a range of magnifications can then be achieved. So a custom prism isn't needed for each beam eccentricity. I added two groups of operands that determine the widths of the incoming and the outgoing beams by determining the ray heights for beams from the far edges of the pupil. The difference between those ray heights is the beam diameter, and the ratio of the beam diameters is the magnification. As it is set up, the magnification is 0.3177, or approximately one-third. By the way, if you want the magnification to be 3, just switch the side that the incoming beam enters. Let's try a magnification of one half instead of one third. So change the vignetting factor to one minus one half. In the merit function, I'll change the desired magnification from what it was to 0.5. And I need to make sure that tilt about y is a variable in both non-sequential components. Run local optimization. And both prisms clearly tilted, and we still have parallel light coming out. Now we have a magnification of almost 0.5. Change this weight and run it again. I found that I could vary the magnification from 1 down to about 1 fifth with this particular pair of prisms. Commercially available prisms do offer a larger adjustment range, but that's what I was able to get with this. And then I couldn't get parallel light coming out anymore. 
Here's a similar invention where the achromatic prism pair is bonded with optical cement. This invention eliminates the step of aligning two discrete prisms relative to each other. The trade-off is losing the degree of freedom that keeps the outgoing beam in the same direction as the incoming beam. And choosing your design is all about trade-offs. Thanks for watching.